Okay, at this point, usually we kind of jump to our guests, and I just wanted to give everyone the heads up that we actually taped this interview with Ed Harrison on Thursday night. It ended up being that my scheduling uh, conflicted, and we couldn't do it on Friday with Ed, so we had taped it early. We just want everybody to know, because in the interview, he talks about the unemployment number, and it is actually, at this point, the number the has number actually been released. So without further ado, here's our interview with Ed from Thursday night. We now have the pleasure to joining us uh, in studio is Ed Harrison, a uh, Real Vision presenter and the author of the Credit Write-Downs newsletter. Uh, he's flown all the way to Toronto to be joined us at the huddle and uh, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. Um, so let's get to it. The lot's happening in the markets, a lot of excitement. Uh, it looks like the, the market is finally a, a, a kind of accepting that maybe the uh, recession or at least an economic slowdown in the U.S. is upon us. What do you think? Yeah, so I think that the data that came out today and yesterday, or actually in, in specifically yesterday and today in terms of the ISM and the PMIs, they were pretty terrible. Uh, the both the ISM for manufacturing and for services were terrible, and then th this uh, the uh, the PMIs from market came out, and they were also kind of negative. Like the composite uh, ISM uh, composite PMI from market was something like 52. So we're definitely looking at a very serious situation. Meanwhile, you have the Chicago Fed with. Charles Evans coming out and saying, you know what, actually, we don't think that we're going to necessarily uh, do anything. You know, the economy is doing OK. And then tomorrow we have the jobs number. So we're sort of at a critical moment. The question is whether or not the Fed is ready to act in some capacity and whether or not the economy continues to sink. I think the jobs number tomorrow will give us a good read on whether that's going to happen. So if the job number is bad, or at least confirms what we've had with the ISM, we have the Fed pricing in an October cut, or at least the Fed funds futures market pricing in an October cut. Do you think the Fed will follow through and actually cut in, in October, which would be a non every two month uh, cut, right? Yeah, I think that they they will follow through. I think it's a, it was a 65% before the the data came out. And so maybe it's gone up beyond that. And basically, the Fed is loath to disappoint. Uh, so they will uh, c come through with that particular cut. But then the question becomes, what's their language? How many dissents do they have? And what are they positioning the market for going forward? And then how does the market react? Because let's say there are three dissents, which there probably will be, just like there was last time. There might be four if there are more than that, especially if it's on the hawkish side, let's say Evans joins Rosengren and and uh, George and dissents on the hawkish side, then the market's going to throw up potentially, and you're going to see bonds rally, maybe even equity sell off. It's it's going to be very interesting this next meeting in uh, this month. So, do you think there's almost no chance that the Fed gets out ahead of the the market? No, I think that the Fed, because uh, yields backed up enough after the summer swoon, they feel they have enough runway in order to soft pedal their future uh, hikes or their future cuts. I mean, they really don't want to cut. Really, when at the end of the day, they're not saying it explicitly, but they know full well that all of these additional policy measures that they have aren't really very good, and they only have 2% of runway. So after the 2% is over, what are they going to do? Are they going to start doing QE uh, out the yin-yang? Are they going to uh, start buying mortgages? I mean, there's only so much they can do, and, and they understand that that's the case. And so as a result, they're trying to keep as much ammunition uh, in, in their back pocket as possible. So, Ed, I have to ask you here. There, I've heard a number of people say that uh, they're thinking that QE4 is coming here in the fourth quarter of the year. Uh, do you think that uh, what, what's your over under on that possibility happening here in the coming meetings? I think that if the data deteriorate further from here, if we see sub 1% GDP growth numbers over a six month period, it would happen. But let's just say, you know, we had 3.1, we had 2.0% 2, 2 in the first two quarters, that we get a 1.5 and say a 0 
that's that's enough 1.5 for q3 0.5 for q4 for them to start saying okay we're going to take what was uh, you know a, a, a increase uh, that we're using on the repos just in order to you know increase the reserves and we're going to turn that into a real qe so i think that they could do that if we see those kinds of numbers so but that would be unusual because we would have qe before we've hit the zero bound which is wasn't the case before right Right. That's right. And, and I think the reason that I could see them doing that is, A, they already have the repos that, that are out there because they have to increase the reserves. And, and B, they don't want to run out of ammunition. They're really very afraid that if they were to run out of interest rate cuts when they really need it the most, then it could be bad. And we know if you look at the QE1s, 2, and 3 in the last uh, decade, what happened at every single juncture was actually yields went up because the yield curve is mostly determined by the consensus view of future policy. It's not a, a supply and demand thing where the Fed comes in and yields go down. Actually, they go up because people are saying the Fed has our back. As a result, uh, the economy will do better. And so yields go up in anticipation of uh, less uh, uh, um, you know, uh, of, of better policy going forward, better uh, economy going forward. So I think that they're hoping that they could do that with QE4. Well, Ed, you're, you're just, uh, you're preaching the converted there because I've long argued that uh, QE is, an, is by its very definition supposed to be inflationary. And what is a long bond investor's worst nightmare? It's inflation. So if, they, if, if QE is effective, it should cause the long end to sell off. Uh, you mentioned the repo market. You know, there was the kind of repo gate or whatever it was uh, a week and a half or two weeks ago. What's your thinking behind what caused that? And was it a signal that something is broken in the plumbing of, the, of this market? Or was it just a case that they were caught a little unaware and uh, it was a technical in nature like the New York Fed is claiming? Yeah, I think that since we haven't really seen a lot of action on that in the time period since they were caught out, with the repo markets that likely their explanation, the New York Fed, is, is the right one. I mean, th what happened pre-excess reserves was that the Fed w had an interest rate that it needed to set, and when it set that rate, it needed to supply the as many reserves as necessary for the banking system, given the loans that the banking system was making at that rate in order to keep the rate at that level. If the Fed refused to supply the reserves, they would break the market. They wouldn't be able to keep that rate. So in order to keep the rate, they basically, as a monopoly supplier of reserves, can only do one, have a, a, a rigid rate, but then they have to accept a floating amount of reserves as a result of that. The monopoly supplier can only control one variable there. So now they have all these excess reserves, and they forgot that this is the regime that they were in. And as a result of that, uh, we hit the... Uh, the um, what I would call the level that we were before much earlier than they anticipated because there are lots of regulatory requirements on top of the reserve uh, number. So if you looked at it strictly from a reserve requirement perspective, you wouldn't expect that reserves were short. But there are a lot of other things that are going on in the plumbing of the system that happened since the great financial crisis in 08 that say that now we're short reserves. And so now that the Fed understands that we are short reserves, they're going to supply those reserves and the whole repo problem is going to go away. And OK, so let's just back up here a little bit. You're explaining a situation where the Fed's figured out the repo. They've got that all fixed up. But yet you think that they're going to be behind in terms of rate cuts. They're not going to they're at least not going to jump out ahead of the market and, and go out and try to get ahead of the cuts that the market, the the. Fed futures have priced in. Do you see a situation where that is going to be a risk-off environment and equities could have a significant hiccup then going forward? Definitely, just as we saw in December. I mean, if you rewind, let's go back all the way to 2015-16. So in 2015, Janet Yellen said, we're going to hike. And as I recall, if you looked at the dot plot, they were talking about three or four hikes in 2015 or in 2016. So then the, the data just uh, were terrible. The oil markets were imploding and they took all those hikes off the table. Then they came back and then they started to hike again. 
So all along the way, since 2015, the feds wanted to hike. They've been looking for excuses to hike. The Fed in 2018 actually said three hikes were coming down the pike, and they, they instituted four. They accelerated their timetable with the December hike as the fourth hike that they didn't say that they were going to do in the beginning. So when they did that in the face of bad data, the market threw up. We had a huge uh, problem. It imploded, and then the Fed had to back paddle. But even after they started back pedaling, they were – soft pedaling their back pedal. You know, they, they have never gotten out in front of the market. They've always been forced to relent. The market has led the Fed into uh, the position that they're in now. And that's going to be what's going to happen going forward, in my view. And, and so will that manifest itself with a stock market that, that really has like a, a severe crack? Like, are you thinking that this is something where we could see 10, 20 percent and like something as scary as, you know, December of 18 when we got that kind of liquidity pocket? Yeah, I think that we could get December of 2018, but that's probably the max that you're going to see in a non-recessionary environment. I think that a recessionary environment is where you see the real downside. If you looked at the last two or three uh, bear markets, you know, it, you, you have to go back to the early 90s and uh, Saddam Hussein uh, to get a bear market that wasn't like 40, 50 percent down. Every single bear market since then, 2001, uh, 2007, 8, uh, and 9, were 40, 50 percent declines across the board. So if we have a recession, I think that's going to be the c scenario that you're going to see. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot, Ed. Are we going to have a recession? I, my call right now, th this is how I put it in the Credit Write Downs newsletter. If you look at the data, just straight up at the data, nothing in the data are saying recession is going to happen. Even if you look at market indicators of recession, like the – uh, the spreads on two, twos of tens. It, it's not saying recession. You know, the, the Fed, the New York Fed, uses the three-month to the 10-year. But I look at the two-year to the 10-year, and that hasn't inverted. It hasn't reverted, inverted once. And usually when it does, you have a six- to 18-month lag before you have a recession. So really, the, the macro data, the market data, none of that is saying recession. However, I think that the policy mix and also the uncertainty involved in a lot of the externalities like the trade war, China slowing, et cetera, say that we could late in 2020 have a recession. But I don't see a recession in 2019. I think that, and I've said in the Credit Write Downs newsletter, that we will have a my, my bet is, is that we will have a recession in 2020. So I, I'd say that's the base case. So, Ed, th that means that uh, you, you're making the call that uh, we're going to get into the next presidential election without being in a recession. Is that a fair way to assess your view right now? Yeah, I think that to the degree that we have a recession, it's going to be towards the tail end of the election cycle. But, you know, slowing into the election cycle, into the actual election, or potentially even a recession right, you know, right then and there is really going to have a negative impact. It's going to negatively impact Trump if he's the nominee for the Republicans, which, by the way, is looking not as 100 percent as it did before. <laughs> Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about China. What do you think is going on there? And do you think that uh, Trump's policies are having a, a bad effect as the China kind of hawks are, are trying to portray? Yeah, my view on China is that the growth levels that they had from before are unsustainable, that the, the, the mix, the policy mix that they had, uh, which was heavily industrial, heavily based on infrastructure was is, was not sustainable uh, and as they've moved tried to move away from that mix uh, they've gotten down their growth has come down and i think that it's never going to go back to the levels that it was before they're just too large an economy to sustain that level of growth over the longer term so all of the downside that we've seen or a, a large majority of it is what you would expect to happen and only at the margin is what's happening with Trump 
impacting China. China is such a large economy that it's hard to believe that those tariffs are going to have you know one, two percent, three percent of GDP types of impact. So your argument is that uh, that this was kind of going to happen anyways, and that Trump just kind of maybe pushed it along a little, but the reality was China was headed this way anyways. Exactly. And, and you know, it, it goes to the vulnerability. When you talk about the, I, I saw Ryan Avent, who I, I believe is still at The Economist, he had a, a, a tweet storm today, and he was talking about the exact same thing with the United States. He was saying people were talking about trade wars as being the death knell for the United States the, to cause the next recession, the one that I'm saying is a base case for 2020. They're not looking at the reality. The reality is, is A, the United States is the cleanest, dirty shirt. Uh, it's much worse in Europe, and it, the declines are greater in China. And what's more is it's only at the margin. That is, is, is that you're seeing real economy slowdowns, and you're looking at something that potentially could, at the margin, be the tipping point, but it's only a marginal uh, impact. Do you worry about the fact that it seems like that view is consensus and that everyone's already piled into the U.S. assets and that that even if they are the cleanest dirty shirt, or the cleanest shirt in the laundry pile, that it's priced for perfection and that there's, there's inevitably they will disappoint. Eventually there's going to be some sort of uh, mean reversion, if you will. I, mean, I, don't, I don't have a strong view on that. Uh, I, I spoke to a guy when I was on Real Vision, he's a German investor, and his point of, uh, was that if you actually look at uh, the, what's in the S&P 500 versus, say, the DAX or the Nikkei or, or, or even the Euro stocks, if you're taking a look at uh, European-wide assets, and you uh, take a look, you'll see a lot more growth companies, technology companies in the S&P. And if you adjust for th that mix, what you find is, is that the U.S. is not overvalued relative to these other indices, that in fact they're pretty much the same, especially when you're looking at large diversified global companies, you know, the Nestle's of the world versus the equivalent in the United States. And so, you know, the concept that the U.S. is overvalued, he's saying is, uh, you know, is, is, is not correct. And so I, I think that's an interesting point. I, I, I can't really say what my, I don't have a view on that, but I think that that's something that's in my, my thinking. It, it, it definitely gives me pause about the, uh, you know, the reversion to mean that, that I think will, could happen. Right. Uh, based upon the scenario you're kind of envisioning over the next year, what is the one trade or the one opportunity that you think that the market is uh, underappreciating or mispriced? I think they're underappreciating the uh, what I would call the, the the pension grab. That is the grab for duration. So what I think is going to happen is if we have a recession or near recession, uh, or the markets force the Fed into capitulation on rates, that what you'll see is a rapid uh, drawdown like we saw in Germany and in the eurozone. That is, is that pension funds in the United States will understand that if they want to meet their actuarial hurdles, that they need to go longer duration. They're going to, they're going to be like, holy, I don't know if I can curse, but holy cow. Yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're going to be like, holy shit. You know, there you uh, go. We, That's the convexity <laughs> in this curve uh, that we just saw is meaning that, you know, my whole portfolio, the duration just shortened tremendously as a result of, of, you know, the, the, uh, of the flattening of, of yields uh, further out. I have to like, I now I have to buy. I have to buy more than I thought I had to buy. And uh, this is something that the German investor uh, who I was talking to, um, Philip von Dran, was talking about. He said the last 150 basis points, the convexity in that part of the curve caught out the entire European pension companies. They had no idea how much duration shortening they were going to get as a result of that. And as a result, they were almost forced to buy. Well, well there you go, Patrick. 
Uh, Ed's uh, yeah. basically in your camp. He's a he's a raving bond. Thank bull. you very much. He, he's because he, he's a very smart. Yeah, guy. he sounds That's like he's reason. Raul Paul bullish. That's how bullish he is. <laughs> Anyways, Ed, Ed, thank you very much for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit of where people can find more about you and your in your great letter, the credit write downs. Yeah, so they can go to creditwritedowns.com. Uh, I would say about four out of five of the uh, the newsletters that I write are paid, but one out of five is free. They can uh, sign up on the site, get one of the free. If they like it, they can uh, go to the paid version as well, where they, you get more insights on a much more regular basis. Well, great. Thank you very much for joining us, and make sure everyone stick around where you get more of Ed in the after hours.